Okay, it's pretty much time for me to press this button and say hello, good evening, and welcome to episode 52 of Shelf Analysis. Uh, thanks a million for uh, joining us tonight. If you're watching for the very first time, the thought did occur to me tonight, because to be honest with you, given the nature of our guest tonight, there are going to be an awful lot of people watching Shelf Analysis who potentially haven't ever seen an episode before. Thank you, you're very welcome. If you're watching on the YouTube channel, or if you're watching us in the Ricochet Book Club, or maybe you're catching this episode a little bit later on on RTE Culture. Uh, you'll find previous episodes if you go to the YouTube channel with the likes of Owen Colfer, uh, Ian Rankin, Marion Keyes, John Banville, uh, Maggie O'Farrell, Graham Norton, John Irving, Bird Media, Brewstow, uh, Max Porter, Elizabeth Day, loads more. They are every weeknight at eight o'clock. If you fancy joining us for an episode of Shelf Analysis, uh, we started this at the very beginning of early, early lockdown in 2020. It was something that was supposed to last for six weeks and keep us going all the way through it. Of course, here we still are, tail end of 2020. But tonight with a guest that, to be honest with you, I have been attempting to get in some form of interview form for a very long time, mostly real world stuff. And it's just finally now that the, the planets have aligned and we've managed to make this happen um, tonight. I'm going to talk to him in just a second. A couple of bits of house business to do uh, before we get to that. I want to remind you of this. It is the last week of voting for the Unpost Irish Book Awards. If you haven't cast your vote as of yet, the Book Awards, of course, happening in a very different form this year. There won't be the big, lavish, wonderful, boozy, late night, hoo-ha there is normally that you get to watch on TV. There will, of course, be a TV awards ceremony as well. That's coming up in the next few weeks. Uh, but it's your last chance to vote this week. So if you want to check out on postirishbookawards.ie, I know you don't need the lure of 100 euros worth of national book tokens for your vote. You'd merely like to vote for your favorite author. Uh, final week, I think it's this day week, that is your last chance to vote uh, for the Unpost uh, Irish Book Awards. Uh, Monday, in case you missed it, maybe you did, maybe you didn't, the latest of the Eason Must Reads series with myself and Sinead Moriarty. In case you don't know, we pick books four times a year for Eason's. Uh, Sinead picks four, I pick four, and our winter selection was announced this coming Monday, just gone. Those are mine on the left. So uh, the wonderful Art of the Glimpse, the collection of uh, Irish short stories put together by the incredible Sinead Gleeson. The Dictionary of Hiberno-English, I know. I wasn't expecting to pick that one either. Uh, Kevin Barry's new collection of short stories, That Old Country Music, is in there and the autobiography of former president Mary McAleese as well. You can, of course, see Michael Harding and Martina Cox and the Champagne Football Book and Keelan Shanley, the late Keelan Shanley, the late long missed Keelan Shanley's A Light That Never Goes Out, which is also part of that. You'll find details more of all of those on the Easons website as well. Uh, finally, worth the mention too as well, I don't have this week's one, but there it is anyway. If you fancy checking out last week's book show, Carrie uh, Franz, uh, can I start that again? Thank you. Carrie Franzman and Jonathan Plackett uh, were my guests on the book show on RTE Radio 1 this week. Uh, Just Gone, the podcast is out and is available. And John Connell also talks to a book show, uh, a book club uh, about the uh, cow book, uh, that and a bunch of other things as well. We'll have a brand new episode for you coming up this coming Sunday at seven o'clock on RTE Radio 1. It'll be slightly different insofar as you see, this isn't different. Uh, because this is the way I do this show every week. The book show will be slightly different this week in that I'm currently self-isolating uh, while my other half is waiting for a COVID test in the house. I've been here for the last couple of days just faffing around, doing my tax returns, things like that. Um, so as a result of which the book show this week, it's going to happen. It is being put together. It will be presented from my sitting room. Uh, you'll be able to listen to that this coming Sunday at 7 on RTE Radio 1 uh, as well. A couple of things I want to do first of all. I think that's it. I think that's all the information you need. Um, and I think, to be honest with you, given the nature of uh, the questions that we have in already and the amount of people who are already asking stuff, I should probably get cracking and actually get on uh, to tonight's guest. Uh, he's a man whose work I've liked for such an extraordinarily long time. And it's a genuine privilege to be able to press a button and say, welcome to Shelf Analysis, Neil Gaiman. Good evening. Thank you. What a delight to be here. Uh, tell, tell me a little bit, about, firstly, about where you are. It's it's the first question for everybody on Shelf Analysis in that we are living in strange and unusual times, to use the cliche again and again and again. So so what have the last few months been like for you? Uh, very, very weird. Um, so I'm on the Isle of Skye in, in Western Scotland, which is where my house in the UK happens to be. Um, I got caught in lockdown in... Uh, New Zealand, where I was visiting uh, for a couple of days as my wife wrapped up her world tour and uh, wound up coming out here mostly because I have a 
ridiculous amount of work that is happening in the UK uh, now and over the next 18 months in terms of uh, TV stuff that I'm, I'm making happen. Um, but kind of because I am an idiot and because I really hadn't quite understood how things were going to work, um, I, I didn't actually expect to get stuck or uh, 12,000 miles away from my very small son for month after month after month because having left New Zealand, of course, I cannot return to New Zealand. So mm. I finally got permission from the lovely New Zealand immigration authorities to get back in. And now I finally just got permission to uh, actually, you have to get a quarantine hotel. So I had to get mm. a, one, a waiting list for that, but that's come through. So I'm now actually have a timetable and on the 3rd of January, I will be hugging my son. That's so. an extraordinary process to have to go through. And, and congratulations, by the way, because we, we have been th we've been through this. The original interview we were supposed to do was on New Zealand time, and it would have been recorded at some bizarre hour where I was I, I was here and you were there. It's it's genuinely lovely to, to, to hear that that's where you are right now. Have you been managing to work over over the last few months? Because talking to, to, to guests here and talking to writers, they, they fall into two very distinct camps. There are those who just say, well, normally I'm quite isolated anyway. I work very well in this sort of circumstance. And then the other half of people who go, oh, my mind has been scrambled. My mind has been scrambled. Okay. I'm, I'm definitely a, um, and I and I normally am somebody who I am quite isolated when I work. If I can, my ideal for getting an incredible amount of work done would be let me you know that's why i have a house on the isle of sky it's it's a long way from anywhere nobody's going to come knocking on the door and i get a lot of writing done here normally um but it doesn't really work like that um apparently in covid times i think partly because the areas of my head that normally are involved with making stuff up and imagining futures are uh, actually um they're, they're they're worrying about the world they're mm. trying to figure things out and uh also of course at least in my world now there's the weirdness of um zoom calls and having because there are so many things we're trying to make happen right now in terms of particularly televisual things. Um, the one that I can talk about, obviously, is, is Sandman because we're shooting that. And then there are ones that I can't talk about because they haven't yet been announced. Um, but there is that thing of me settling down to do some writing. And then just as I hit my groove, uh, I have to stop and do a Zoom call and then do another Zoom call, and then go and make a cup of tea, and then come back, and I have no idea where I was or what I yeah. was doing. Uh, so, but with all that, um, you know, I've written a bunch of introductions to other people's books. I've written uh, one short story. I've made some progress on a novel. I've written... Uh, three television scripts. So it, it's not like I haven't done anything, but I haven't done anything compared to what I would normally do if I was on my own for eight months. Can I suggest your setup, though, is fantastic for these Zoom calls. You have a professional microphone, which is more than I have as an actual broadcaster. I've never managed to go, I should probably bring a microphone into this setup. And you've got a magnificent set of headphones as well. Is that for your own comfort? Is that just so you can get no. through this? Not at all. This is because uh, I've had to do a fair amount of professional stuff mm. um, using a mic and headphones, and I've had to learn how to work a program called Reaper. Um, I've what have I done? I've recorded a, a BBC audio project, uh, several Audible things. Um, I had to do several short stories that had never been recorded before for the Neil Gaiman reader, this giant book of, of stuff of mine. And we put we, we could almost put together an audio book, but I had to do the intro and I had to do 
I think three short stories that I hadn't recorded before. So there's there's all stuff like that. Um, so actually, it just got easier to have a proper professional setup. And this isn't even the proper professional setup. The proper professional setup is me hauling all of this stuff to a room upstairs, which is uh, really well padded and mm -hmm. has big curtains and carpet, and no echo at all. And then setting up these monstrous things. Um, hang on, I'm gonna stop a phone call from happening. There we go. Not the first time that's um, happened on this program. Uh, normally it's my mother, but not <laughs> this time for once. Um, so I, I, I have a giant setup with uh, these sort of movable walls that absorb all sorts of sound and uh, create a sort of proper dead room in the space. So there's, there's, I've definitely done uh, two full audio plays while I've been here, a bunch of short stories. And I, in the next few days, I have to set it all up again up there to do a professional quality recording of the poem that I did for UNHCR last year, uh, What You Need to Be Warm, because they'd made a film to go along with it. And uh, they now need me to record it so that that'll be the soundtrack for the film. People rarely see the rock and roll lifestyle part of this. And it is that it's creating dead rooms in your own house because you've, you've no alternative to, 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 to do that. And um, maybe just before we move on, and I'm going to scroll back ever so slightly, you've said you can talk a little bit about Sandman. And I think Sandman was, was the first way that uh, I got into your work initially. I think all, all those years ago, I was a big comic book reader. Maybe tell us a, a little bit about where that is right now and what's happening with it. Uh, Sandman, uh, well, it, it's being made by uh, Warner TV for Netflix. Um, we were meant to start shooting in May, but COVID happened. And uh, I was absolutely delighted and amazed in October when it started shooting. And uh, we've, um, what can I tell you? Um, I we're not everything yet, obviously. Oh well, okay. Well, we're not yet <laughs> announcing any of the casting, although some of it is jaw dropping, mm -hmm. um, and uh, I think they're they're sort of waiting for the right moment, possibly when the world is slightly less distracted. Um, for me, I, I guess the most important thing um, was not when we started shooting, because I was. I was very happy. I'd co-written the pilot script uh, with David Goya and with Alan Heinberg, who is the, the real showrunner. Um, it wasn't getting the production designs. It wasn't seeing the first day's shooting. For me, it was a camera test. And it was a camera test of the actor playing Morpheus, wearing nothing at all but a big bedhead of hair um, in a glass globe in a cellar under a, a huge sort of stately home and uh, watching the camera pull in on him as he slowly moved and the light caught his face. And all of a sudden, I thought, this is Sandman. It really mm. is. It's actually happening. This thing that's been in my head for all of this time is now going to be moving. And also, I, I suppose the weirdness of that was the idea that for the last 33 years, people like you who, who've read Sandman were the last generation to read it before it was also a thing that happened on the screen. Mm -hmm. And uh, that, suddenly hit home in a way that nothing else had. Um, it was profoundly moving for me and also has from time to time been really um, peculiarly vindicating for me age 26 or 27, the me who wrote the scripts that we're currently shooting and adapting because I'll 
we'll we'll come up with clever ways of doing things and then they don't quite work and then we have to figure out how to solve it and then normally alan heinberg says look i've been looking at the original graphic novels and why don't we just do this hmm. and somewhere a 26 year old neil gaiman is who had no idea what he was doing is smirking because these clever men who've been doing this for years are going, ah, you got it right after all. G given that um, you, you, you've mentioned your age, I'm going to try something we've never done on 52 episodes of this program. So you're going to bear with me. This is a, some small stunt work that's going to happen uh, at this end. Hang on for one minute. I'm ready. Okay, hang on. Because like, I'm not ready, to be honest. And I have no idea whether this is going to work or not. So, okay, here we go. One of those. It was your birthday yesterday. It so was. Happy birthday to you. <laughs> happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Neil. Happy birthday to you. Now, because we're currently self-isolating, all I could manage was a bagel. We couldn't get anything cake-based, but it's the thought that counts will be my theory. So happy birthday. Do I get to try and blow it out from here? Or I think you blow, you blow that yeah, okay. I'm okay with that. Really. One, One, two, two three. Okay. And congratulations and happy birthday. Uh, I know it's Thank a couple you. of days later, but um, it was a substantial one as well. Do you want to talk about that? or you I'm, want to I'm, six, I'm 60. I'm, I, I feel officially uh, kind of elderly. It's it's kind of like, <laughs> yes, I'm, I'm 60 years old. I, I never really planned for 60. I, I, you know, I remember as a kid walking around and going, in the year 2000, I'll be 40. And that seemed incredibly old, but there, there had to be life beyond that. And sometimes I think when the year 2010, I'll be 50. But it had never even occurred to me that 60 would happen. Or indeed, um, that when I hit 60, I would be looking forward to writing things and it would still be fun. Um, I, I had an email exchange today with my friend Kim Newman. And I, I mentioned when Kim and I were both journalists starting out with dreams of being writers, um, we met a, a very, to my mind, elderly and um, critic, uh, a, a, a major critic who was now sort of fallen on slightly hard times and and i remember this meeting with him and kim having to explain to me who he was and what his significance was in the world and i just remember how incredibly old he was and thinking whoa you know that's must be hard to be sort of that kind of thing and out of curiosity emailing kim today i i looked up this person's date of birth on wikipedia and discovered that at the point where Kim and I were marveling at his age and decrepitude, uh, he would have been 52. Mm -hmm. And it's sort of like going, that's, oh my gosh, we were so gloriously arrogant age 23. Um, so, uh, you know, it, it's, whereas now I'm like, oh, I've, I've definitely got another 20 years of writing left in me, probably another 25, um, which is good because I've got lots of stories left to tell and it would be awful if I didn't get to tell them. I, I am going to ask about the Neil Gaiman reader in a minute, but I, I was going to include this later, but given that you've just mentioned that point in your life where you were you know, much younger and where you were a journalist and before being a full-time writer, would you think? Uh, I was in Boston uh, I think about eight years ago now at this point. And Boston has great secondhand bookstores. Uh, I was in a place called Brattle Books in, in Boston. And I came across something that prior to that point I hadn't even known existed. And it's something I've held on to and always swore that if I ever got to speak to you, I'd ask you to tell me a little bit about this. And it's this, which is, <laughs> don't panic. This is your official companion to The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy from I think 1988, if I'm right. That sounds right. Tell me a little bit about this thing of beauty. Ah, uh, when I was 22, the 
first major interview I did as a young journalist. Um, not the first interview, but the first one that I thought that was that was big and important was Douglas Adams. And I interviewed Douglas. Um, and, and I think I interviewed him for Penthouse initially. Um, the UK Penthouse who had a, a lot of big arty section and people read it for the articles. Yeah. Uh, well, I don't know if they did or not, but they certainly paid real money for journalists writing articles. And, and Douglas had a book to promote, um, called the meaning of Liff. So I, I did a whole piece on that. And a few years later, I got a call from uh, Nick Landau at Titan Books saying um, we were going to do, we have permission to do a book about Douglas and Hitchhikers and our writer has just decided he doesn't want to do it. Would you like to be the writer? Uh, we know that we, you've interviewed Douglas. And I said, absolutely. And it was wonderful. I got to spend um, several months. I'd, I'd go over to Douglas's house. I would go through his files. He just sort of gave me free run of stuff. And I'd, I'd uh, read all of the press clippings and everything like that. And I got to do four or five really long interviews with Douglas. Um, and uh, I, I don't think, it's, it's very hard to say that we became friends because he was Douglas Adams and I would have been a 25 or 26 year old journalist um, doing a book about him. But um, we, we became whatever in, in that weird territory between friends and workmates and acquaintances is, we, we were that. And uh, I had an enormous amount of fun writing the book. And Douglas, I remember, had given us permission to do the book for free. He had asked nothing for it. And I don't think he expected anything much to happen. And then when I handed him the manuscript, uh, it was um, incredibly popular. And uh, it was sold in America for a very hefty advance, which was kind of wonderful. And then Douglas said that he really thought he ought to have half of that hefty advance, <laughs> even though he had said that uh, we could have it for nothing. And given that Douglas's accountant had just run off with all of Douglas's money and then committed suicide, uh, we were only too willing to give Douglas half of the money. Um, and it was, it was a joy working with him and Douglas and I remained friendly and emailing and chatting until his death, which, uh, broke my heart. It's, it's an extraordinary book. I'm not sure if it's still in, in, in print because the only place I've ever come across it was in that secondhand bookstore and I snaffled it up for the cheap price of $5.95, which I still have now, but if people can get their hands on it, it's 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 wonderfully insightful and it has, I think, tons of, of, of you in it and, uh, as well. Um, to, to, to talk about tons of you, this is a thing of beauty. It's not physically in shops as of yet. The covers, both the, the US and, the, and this is the UK one, are amazing. Um, tell us a little bit about what is in the Neil Gaiman Reader. Uh, what is in the Neil Gaiman Reader is a, mostly for me, it's a way of stopping people asking me what I do or what they should read. Um, what is in there is 47 short stories. Some of those short stories actually contain smaller short stories in a sort of fractal kind of way. There's a there's a short story in there called The Calendar of Tales, which contains 12 stories. And there's one called Mythic Creatures, which I think contains six stories. Um, and also, we put in five extracts from novels, only the adult novels. Um, so it's a book really for people who say, what do you do? And when I tell them I'm a writer, they say, what kind of thing do you write? And I say everything, all sorts of stuff. And then they 
say, well, what does that mean? And I say, honestly, it really is all sorts of stuff. And they say, well, what should I read? And I say, what do you like? And it's all a bit messy. This way, yeah. there is a book that is huge. You could use it to stun a burglar, which has always been my uh, measure of what good art is. And um, it's it's you can find things you like, and there will undoubtedly be things you don't like. And one of the coolest things, I think, is that Marlon James uh, wrote the introduction and outed himself as a fan, which was so cool because I knew Marlon very vaguely and we'd always been very sort of hip and cool around each other. Like, you're the dude who won the book. And he's <laughs> like, yeah, you're, you're the old gamer. And then I said, would you, would you like to write the thing? He's like, yeah. And then he sends me the, uh, the intro and I'm like, you were this mad fanboy the whole time and you kept it a secret. And he's like, yep. Very proud of himself. He, he does strike you, and I've interviewed him on a couple of occasions, as obviously being far too cool to out himself as that kind of fanboy, uh, except this is the perfect moment to, to, to make that happen. Exactly. And, you know, he found me in a library, which makes me so happy that he was, you know, a kid in Jamaica and reading me in the library. Um, he found his copy of Anansi Boys and he was hooked. I was like, yes, good. We're in business. Uh, allegedly, we are here to talk about books that, that you love. I know we haven't quite gotten there yet, but you've made some really interesting and fantastic selections, including stuff that I've never heard of before, which is always one of the, the, the things I like most about um, shelf analysis. So where would you like to start uh, in terms of books that you've chosen? I'm going to reach over and pick up the piece of paper on which I printed my list. There we go. Fantastic. Um, where would I like to start? I want to start with... Uh, this, which is really, really heavy. And uh, I Yowzers. was grumbling to you earlier that I don't have, I, that I wish so much that I was actually in my library in America where I have everything. Here, I don't have everything, but I do have this. And I have a few books. And this is the Folio Society edition of Gene Wolfe's the Book of the New Sun. And the Folio Society did these incredibly gorgeous editions, and I got to write the introduction to this, which meant the world to me. Um, so I, let me tell you briefly, The Book of the New Sun is a book by Gene Wolfe, an American author. It either consists of four books, these four, The Shadow of the Torturer, The Claw of the Conciliator, The Sword of the Lictor, and The Citadel of the Autark. Um, it either consists of these four, or you can add in the fifth, which I would, which is called The Earth of the New Sun. It's a... It's an unreliable autobiography or biography um, of somebody who claims to have a perfect and infallible memory, um, a man called Severian, and it's kind of been, it's been described as science fiction's um, a la recherche de Tom Petou. Okay. It, it's, it's, it's about, it's set in the very, very, very far future to the point where if you are mining, you are mining for the waste of past civilizations, uh, the things that we think of as huge towers, we realize after a while are actually long abandoned spaceships that will never fly again. And it's the story of a world in which the sun is dying and of Severian, who is a torturer's apprentice. He's being trained to be a torturer and um, he commits an appalling crime for a torturer's apprentice of actually allow, he falls in love with one of their clients and gives her the means to commit suicide and is expelled as a torturer and goes out into this dying earth and uh, may or may not become the means to bringing the sun back to life again. And it's a remarkable work, and it's something that I go back and 
reread every pretty much every decade. I will go back and reread it, uh, reread it from a slightly different point of view, knowing more, remembering more, seeing more, seeing things that I did not see on previous reads. Um, it's a book. Wolf uses the English language um, to create words and vistas that feel like they are fantasy landscapes, yet every single word is a real word. Uh, you can find them all in a big dictionary. And that in itself is is a sort of strange experience. You're you're digging into words, and uh, and learning as you go. And the story, and you realize also that you have a very honest narrator who may or may not remember everything, but who may not always tell you everything either. I'm going to develop a folio society habit, I think, as a result of even just this series alone. You, you, you're not the first author. David Mitchell recommended stuff uh, earlier in the in the series, and Sean Biffle did as well. That looks absolutely beautiful. Remind us of the title again. That's Gene Wolfe. The Book of the New Sun. Book of the New Sun. Super. And uh, I'm, I have developed an awful folio society <laughs> habit. I, I barely knew they existed. I think I, I had a few sort of 60s folio society things, which... I picked up in old bookshops and then they asked to do American Gods and I said, sure. And they did this incredible edition and did a proofread which caught things from the very, very first edition, like a place where I'd written something down wrong in my notebook and they caught things. So it was this fabulous um, edit. And then they did Anansi Boys and it was even more beautiful and won awards. And I just bought their edition of Tristram Shandy, which I've always wanted to read and just would never be near a copy at the times when I wanted to read it. So I, I bought it. It's a thing of unutterable beauty and it's illustrated by Tom Phillips, who oddly enough is also one of the people that I was going to talk about. Is that you segueing very, very swiftly into Tom? I mean, it's entirely up to you. Actually, it kind of is, although it's completely accidental. I mean, we can not segue and we can come back to him later and it can be like a, a weird callback. People could go, oh, that was that thing he mentioned way earlier. You're um, the storyteller here, not me. I'm going to let you decide the arc of the narrative. Oh, uh, I was going to keep it until the end because it is the strangest of all the books. Uh, okay. I think I'll keep it until the end. Okay. okay. Where are we going next? So um, where we're going next is a book by a woman called Hope Murleys. Now, Hope Murleys is just now beginning to have a kind of revival. Um, her poem, Paris, which was uh, published in 1919 by uh, the Hogarth Press, has just been republished for the first time um, in a hundred years. And it's, it's, people are noticing something that I've been saying for a very long time, which is a lot of the things that we assume happened in the work of T.S. Eliot and the Wasteland, um, and that was where they began, actually began in Paris. Um, in her poem, but I actually wanted to talk about her 1926 novel, Lud in the Mist. Okay. And Lud in the Mist, um, which is now back in print. For a long time, it was out of print. And I, I feel like it's one of the good things that I've done in my life is, you know, there are just a handful of books I've managed to get back into print by banging drums and being loud in favor of them. And, and Lud in the Mist is one of them. I think The Thirteen Clocks by James Thurber is another book I've managed to bring back into print and was ridiculously proud of myself for having done so. Um, but Lud in the Mist is a novel about the mundane and the miraculous and the reconciliation of both. It's about a little town called Lud in the Mist which um, 
and the Kingdom of Doromare, which is prosaic. It's a, it's a place without magic, and it is next to fairyland, and there is some kind of fairy, but it's there's nothing twee, there's nothing winged, there's nothing sweet. Um, Hope Merley's really knew her mythology well. She was the partner um, of Jane Harrison, the classicist, and understood both her classics and her English folklore, and uses both. So her fairyland is also the kingdom of the dead. Um, fairy fruit is sometimes smuggled over the border and eaten by people who it gives visions to and it changes them. Uh, but because fairy does not exist, it is actually described as silk. And you can only be prosecuted for smuggling silk, not smuggling fairy fruit. The mayor of the city, Nathaniel Chanticleer, um, is the most prosaic and practical of men until he discovers that his son, Ranulf, has been eating fairy fruit. And the novel becomes a detective story. It's a history. It's a... Um, it's not like anything else. And I think that's why I, I love it so much. It sits there as a pre-Tolkien-esque fantasy, which is, for me, what might have happened if the fantastic in literature had remained on the literary shelves rather than sort of wandering off to its own section mm. of the bookshop. That sounds fantastic. And remind us the, the title again. Lud in the Mist by Hope Murleys. Because people do ask, and we will we'll list all of these in the in the comments below later on. Okay, uh, third book then, what would you like? Third book would be London Labour and the London Poor by Henry Mayhew. And um, there are various editions of it out there. I, I finally gave up and found a long out of print Dover edition where they actually reprinted the entire London Labour and the London Poor in four volumes. But I think the, the version that I was initially familiar with was the Penguin Classics version. And there are various other editions out there that, that extract from it. Henry Mayhew was a social reformer, also editor of Punch, at one point, and he interviewed the poor, the working poor and the not working poor of London. And he went and talked to them with a stenographer, writing down what they had to say, writing down, very often writing it down in the way that they said it. And these four volumes are just like a Dickens novel that goes on forever in all directions. You get a, whether whether you're learning about Punch and Judy men or the kids who sold fly papers, um, whether you're learning about prostitutes or, or street performers, um, begging letter writers, you know, all of these people are in there, the worthy, the not so worthy, you get their lives and you get their lives in their voices. And it's just remarkable. It will break your heart over and over again. Um, and it feels like over and over again, it allows you to reach across the years, 150 odd years, um, and, and realize that they were us. It's, it's strange in that I'm, I'm reading about Orwell at the moment and about his assertion as well that he could only ever possibly write about people who were genuinely poor if he went and lived with them himself. And that's where Dan and Ed in Paris and, and, and London comes from. Um, that's a very quick recommendation. I'm reading Dorian Linsky's book at the moment about 1984, his biography of Orwell's 1984, which I'm about halfway through and which is super. But again, it makes me want to go and read more of Orwell and Orwell's writings about 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 
certainly in the 1920s and 1930s, um, poverty in, in, in London. That sounds absolutely amazing. And again, something I've never heard of before. Um, where would you like to go next? Um, next, I would like to take a complete left turn and go over to a graphic novel. Fantastic. Because I started out writing comics. I still love comics. And, um, and I wanted to recommend a book called The Years Have Pants. Um, it's by Eddie Campbell. And uh, it, I think the official type of title is actually Alec, The Years Have Pants by Eddie Campbell. Eddie is a cartoonist and a writer. He, he is famed as the artist of uh, From Hell with Alan Moore. But mm -hmm. he's also for many, many years, been telling the stories about uh, Alec McGarry, who is actually Eddie Campbell. Um, somewhere in there, the Alec went away and Alec and, and Eddie stopped pretending that these were about somebody else who just happened to look exactly like him and have had the things that he had happened to him. Um, and, but Eddie started doing these um, in the late 70s, early 80s. So you have a kind of a wonderful 40-year-on autobiography in pictures. And it's delicate, it's funny, it's moving, it's heartbreaking, um, it's true. And I hope that there'll be another edition in 20 years time of everything that he's done since with that stuff in. Um, but Eddie is, is, I think he's a genius. And I think he does things in comics with pictures and with words that nobody could do in prose. And that for me is always the mark of, of really something beautiful. I've spent probably, a, a, a uh, as much time as, as you have, we're trying to convince people who read serious literary fiction, and I put quotation marks around that, uh, to read some of the best comic book and graphic novel uh, material that's that's out there. How do you do? You have do you have something you can use? Do you have a magic wand that can just convince people? You know, th this could be for you. Um. The, the nearest I ever get to it is really spending time with them talking about what they like uh, in terms of literature and then trying to figure out the thing that would most closely approximate that in comics. But truthfully, for me, um, I remember what the battle used to be like. I remember going on American radio in 1990, being interviewed about Good Omens, the book I'd written with Terry Pratchett, and them saying, so, uh, uh, Neil, I, I understand that you write uh, comic books. So uh, what, what do you do? Do you do the, the words in the Teenage uh, Mutant Ninja Turtle like their, their word balloons? And I'm like, and I, I said, well, no, I, I write, you know, comics for adults. They're like, oh, so, uh, so, uh, yeah, I guess they'll write some porno comics. I guess we're going to move on from there. And you're just going, no, I don't want porno comics. I write comics for grown ups. And, and you could see that the concepts did not work for them. The, the entire idea that there could be comics aimed at adults was one that did not exist. Since then, Mouse won a Pulitzer for Art Spiegelman. You know, the, the, we're in a world in which various literary awards have been won by enough comics, enough graphic novels over the years that I think you now have a generation that has grown up with the idea that, no, these things are, these things are literature too. Hmm. Um, I'm going to ask where else we go from here. You, 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 do, you have other things. I thought we'd go to my late friend, Diana Wynne-Jones. Great. And um, I, before ever I knew and loved Diana Wynne-Jones, I loved her books. Um, I, I 
my only regret was that she had not been writing her fiction when I was a child. I, I found her book, uh, Charmed Lives, when it was pub Charmed Life when it was published, uh, and I would have been seventeen, going on eighteen. And I thought, this is brilliant. This person is brilliant. I wish I'd read this when I was seven. Mm -hmm. um, and in later years, I was thrilled that we became friends. Um, I, I valued her opinion as a reader. She was acerbic, brilliant, did not suffer fools gladly or in any other way, um, but was also incredibly kind and was just one of my favorite people. Getting a letter, a handwritten letter from Diana was always the high point of any month. Um, her novel, Archer's Goon, fascinates me. Fascinated me when I read it, fascinates me still. It's probably not her best novel. Um, I would hesitate to say what her best novel is, possibly Howl's Moving Castle, mm -hmm. maybe Fire and Hemlock. There's, there's a giant list she wrote. She was the best writer about magical things and about childhood that I think we've ever had. Um, I, I was so happy that in later life, books of hers like Witch Week were picked up by the people who loved J.K. Rowling and went, ah, this person does that thing that J.K. Rowling does, only she does it better and she was doing it first. That made me happy. Um, but Diana's book, Archer's Goon, begins incredibly simply with a kid coming home to find a thug, the goon of the title, uh, sitting in his kitchen, refusing to leave until his father hands over the thousand words he's meant to have written that month, and they haven't got the thousand words. And it turns out his father is a writer and had done some kind of deal with somebody to write a thousand words a month as a way of getting through writer's block. And he'd always write these thousand words. And as the story unravels, you discover there are seven mysterious figures who own, who farm a town not unlike Bristol. And um, Archer is in charge of technology. One of them is in charge of crime. One of them is in charge of music. They, they have different, different roles. And uh, our hero has to try and untangle the mystery of his father's thousand words and what this family wants and uh, why those thousand words appear to be keeping them trapped in Bristol and unable to take over the rest of the world. And it's a glorious book um, with an ending that like all of Diana's endings, if you're reading it yourself as an adult, you get to the end and you go, hang on, how did she do that? What, what just happened? And you wind up rereading. But if you're reading it to a child as a bedtime story at a chapter a night for a week or so, when you get to the end, you realize how incredibly elegantly every single brick in the structure was laid. That's, uh, again, I only came to her, I think, probably like most people through the Studio Ghibli version of, of Hell's Moving Castle. Um, but I think that was a, that was a gateway for, for a lot of people as well. That sounds absolutely super. OK, um, what is next, Neil? I thought I would take a uh, an elderly beloved book and I picked The Man Who Was Thursday okay. by G.K. Chesterton. Um, and I think it would be fair to say that not all of Chesterton has aged well. Um, when I was a 10 or 11 year old who discovered Chesterton, I remember reading a book of his called The Flying In and going, this is really kind of creepy on a lot of levels. Um, it's also not a terribly good book, although I love the poems. 
that he dots through the text of the novel. Um, but I loved the Napoleon of Notting Hill, and I really, really loved The Man Who Was Thursday. And the subtitle of A Man Who Was Thursday is A Nightmare. And at the end of the day, I think all spy fiction, all good spy fiction of the second half of the 20th century um, goes back in a lot of ways to The Man Who Was Thursday. The idea of The Man Who Was Thursday is a young man winds up more or less accidentally infiltrating the inner council of a group of anarchist terrorists. And um, he is Thursday. They all have the days of the week. And they are all being run um, by a mysterious... They, 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 or rather, he is um, actually a police spy working for a mysterious figure who he has not seen. And everything, these, these terrifying anarchists are all um, really working for their leader, the terrifying and huge Sunday. And uh, as the story goes on, and, and it's that thing where you don't want to give spoilers away for people who haven't read it, but you have to kind of spoil it a little bit slowly he realizes that he is not the only police spy on the anarchist council let us let us say that um and it's a book about identity it's a book about the feeling of being in dreams uh reading it as an adult i started marveling at the fact that the weather in each chapter is emotional weather. It is a nightmare. It's not locational weather. You can go from a snowy day somewhere to full sun to a sunny day in summer somewhere else, and and you do it without even noticing. Uh, it's because that's where it feels right, and it's a novel about faith and belief, and it's a novel. Um, that I think in, in a lot of ways says things that in Chesterton's more relig more overtly religious writing, I think he kind of fought against um, and would have argued against. But in The Man Who Was Thursday, you definitely get the feeling that perhaps the devils and the angels can be much too easily mistaken for each other and may even be the same people. And that sounds absolutely fantastic. That's G.K. Chesterton again, who I, to my great sadness, have never uh, read before. So, okay, another one for my list. Um, are we at, at our last one or our second last we are, one? We are, I think we're at our last one. I okay. think we'll, we'll do the last one. Um, and, I, and I'm gonna show it to you. I actually have it here. Super. And it needs to be shown. And it is a book called a Humorment okay. by Tom Phillips, who you may remember that I mentioned earlier as I the do. illustrator of the folio edition of Tristram Shandy. Um, this is the fourth edition of A Humorment. I'm at this point in time unclear on how many there are. I think that there may be six, but the last one of all is called the final edition. So um, that's a little bit, it, it means you don't actually remember how many there are. Um, it's also far from the first that I bought. This one has a purplish cover. Mm -hmm. I think the first one I bought was the third edition, which I think had a green cover, or it may have been the one with the brown cover. Um, and I've been giving them to people ever since. And Tom Phillips is an artist who has been, um, here, I'm gonna move my little clip on light so that I can actually shine the light on the page. 
give you a bit more uh, information. So what he's done is he has taken a Victorian novel called A Human Document. Uh, he has bought, anytime he ever sees a copy of this obscure Victorian novel, he buys a copy. And he has created his own novel within the pages of A Human Document. Each page he paints into, he finds and circles words on them. Oh, let's, can I? He finds and he circles words and creates his own sentences. And you wind up with this thing that is, I don't know what it is. It, it says on the cover, it's a treated Victorian novel. It's definitely art. It definitely has a kind of a plot. Um, and the plot obviously kind of reflects the plot of the original Victorian novel in some ways. It's not like anything else I've ever read. Um, and it's astonishingly beautiful. It's, it's an act of poetry. It's an act of art. It's an act of literary graffiti. Um, and it's something that I love to give people and just to be able to say to them, this is, this is something that you haven't read before. And I think you'll like it. And it's a humor moment by Tom Phillips. I think anytime you come across something that you can say, this is unlike anything I've ever read before, that immediately makes it something that's, that's worth paying attention to. I, I should, we do have questions. I'm conscious we have kept you an hour. You've, you've beat the David Mitchell record at this point, which we did talk about earlier, and we've done it in a heartbeat without, without even th thinking. I'm going to ask maybe just one or two brief questions that have uh, come in. Uh, Elaine's is less of a, 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 a question and more of a statement. This is Elaine Egan. She says, one of the nicest authors I've worked with. Neil spent five hours signing books for fans until two in the morning. That's Elaine from Hachette here in Ireland. Um, oh. I'm going to give you uh, Emer's question. Emer says, any chance you could ask what Neil uh, ask Neil what it was like to work with the late, great Terry Pratchett. Huh, it was amazing. Um, I, I was very, very lucky uh, to work with Terry. I, I, I remember Terry phoning me up and saying, yeah, that, that thing that you sent me, he sent me 5,000 words of something, and are you still working on that? And I said, no, I've started doing the Sandman thing instead. And he said, well, look, I know what happens next. So either you can sell me the idea or we can write it together. And, and I said, well, well, we'll write it together because I knew how good Terry was. I don't think the world knew how good Terry was at that point, but I knew that I did. And... And I knew that that was a lot like Michelangelo saying, look, come over to my place and we'll play the ceiling. <laughs> so, I, you know, Terry was a, he was a genius and working, and, and not just a genius in the sense of he, you know, in fact, in some ways he wasn't a genius, which is what made him so much more interesting. He was a craftsman. Um, Douglas Adams was a genius. And Douglas was kind of tortured and didn't really enjoy writing novels and, and was really good at things, but would much rather not have done, but was astoundingly brilliant and good at it. Terry got there by hard work and he became a fabulous writer because he wrote 400 words every night while he was working for the electricity board. And one night he finished a novel and he still had 200 words to go. So he put another sheet of paper in the typewriter and started the next novel. Um, and that's why Terry Pratchett was a genius. 
I'm going to ask you one more question as well, and it's a slightly selfish one in that Karen B, who uh, put this question in comments, she says, Harlan Ellison is my favorite writer. I know you're a fan of his also. Which story of his do you like the best and why? I'm an enormous Harlan Ellison fan too, and that's an impossible question, so best of luck with that. I don't know that I could answer that question. Um, last time I was in Ireland, I'll, I'll get there the long way while I, while I give myself time to think about it. Last time I was in Ireland, I was staying at the Clarence Hotel um, in Dublin, and it was Harlan's birthday. And I phoned him up and I wished him happy birthday. And I said, what do you want for your birthday? And he said, just, just come and see me the next time you're in L.A., kiddo. So next time I landed in L.A., I didn't have time to go and see Harlan. I really, there was no way I could do it. But it was, he'd asked for it as a birthday present and I made it work. I pushed a meeting back. I went from the airport directly to Harlan's place and I spent an hour with him. At that point, he'd had a stroke. He was basically confined to bed, but his mind was as sharp as it had ever been. And we talked and it was that kind of just really good, weird, honest talk where everything is said and nothing is left unsaid and you leave and and it's all good and harlan died two weeks later and i was so glad that i'd phoned him on his birthday from the clarence i was so glad that he'd asked for that visit as a birthday present and i was so glad that i was that I, I gave it to him because it, it felt magical. Um, favorite stories of Harlan's, are, it, it's so hard um, because when I get the start, I can just keep going. I have no mouth and I'm a scream is, an, is a tour de force and was the first story of Harlan's I remember reading. Uh, it's only about six pages long, and it's about the last handful of people left alive in a world owned and controlled by a malevolent supercomputer that is taking joy in torturing them. And that was, uh, was as a stories go, um, I just remember reading it as a kid. I would have been 10 or 11. And it's the kind of thing that makes you go, oh, you can do that. I hadn't realized you could do that. I, I didn't know you were allowed to do that. And all of the best Harlan Ellison stories for me felt like you were watching somebody who had realized that there was a door marked no entry but if you just backed backed through it, so it looked like you were walking forward, you could you could go anywhere. Mm -hmm. And the power of of stories like that. There was one called this is a story called Death Bird Stories, which and and the story uh, the book called Death Bird Stories, and the story in there just called the Death Bird, um, which is a sort of science fiction story that's also a look at um the creation and genesis that's also a set of moral questions that are asked about events in harlan's life i, I mean you you and it shouldn't work and it absolutely does um and every now and again I will write a story where I do something that bends the rules or, or does something that you shouldn't really be able to do. And every time I do it, I think about Harlan. I, I think that's 
an extraordinary place to finish uh, this conversation. And it's been a genuine joy to talk to you. And thank you so much for taking a full hour out of your life to come on to, to Shelf Analysis of a night when I'm sure you have 50 better things that, that you could be doing. And hopefully we get to do this at some point in the real world on a stage back in front of real people when we're allowed to do all of those sort of things. That would be, that would be wonderful. I would love that so much, Rick. Neil Gaiman from Sky, thank you so much for joining us tonight. Cheers. Thank you, Rick. That was that. That was episode 52. If you're just tuning in now, scroll back. It is worth it to find all of the rest of the episodes. Um, next week on Shelf Analysis, a quick shout out and worth the mention. Uh, it is going to be Dr. Marie Cassidy, uh, who has her new book out. Uh, she is my guest this time next week on Shelf Analysis. That's next Wednesday night at 8 p.m. Other than that, I will catch you on the book show this coming Sunday on RTE Radio 1 from 7 p.m. Uh, you'll be able to watch back all of the episodes on Shelf Analysis on the YouTube channel, if that's not where you're watching right now, uh, here on RTE Culture as well. And other than that, have yourself an absolutely lovely week. And I'll see you again same time next week. Cheers. Oh, wait, 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 wait. And don't forget the Irish Independent Review section uh, this coming Saturday, and they'll have a piece on next week's show. Almost forgot it. It's every single week I tend to forget the Irish Independent Review this coming weekend on Saturday. I'm done. I'm going now.